coming to, uh, to tonight's debate on the question of whether Harvard University should divest its holdings in fossil fuel companies. One of the most valuable aspects of the Harvard experience is the opportunity to engage in debate on the major issues before our community, whether you define that community as the world, the country, Cambridge, or this university. The ability to debate ideas and to respect and value differences of opinion is one of the most prized benefits of being a partner. Tonight's topic is one that has stimulated strong views, partly because it touches on one of the great issues of this generation, as well as the generations that will follow, climate change. I would like to thank the Kennedy School's Environment and Energy Professional Council for their sponsorship of this event, and to Lizzie Burns and to Thomas uh, and Sua for their leadership in making it possible. The moderator for tonight's uh, uh, event is Christine Russell. Uh, she is a senior fellow in the school's Environment and Natural Resource Program. She is the president of the Council of the Advancement of Science Writing, and was for many years the national science writer for the Washington Post and Washington Star. I cannot think of a better person to take on the role of moderating this event. Uh, I'm really delighted uh, to be here, and I was assuring our two speakers that because there were no people here about 10 minutes ago, that did not mean anything in Kennedy School time. Uh, so it's, as Henry has said, and all of you are here, uh, to consider this question about whether Harvard University should divest from fossil fuels as a means to address the climate change crisis. And by uh, best account, this is the first Harvard Kennedy School debate on this, and perhaps the first Harvard University debate. There have been panels and discussions, uh, but we will say that uh, this is uh, one of the first debates on this topic. And obviously, recently, it has been much in the news of uh, the question of whether to do it here, other universities, private and public institutions around the world. And more than 200 institutions, including the recently The Guardian Newspaper Media Group, Syracuse University, Stanford University, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and the World Council of Churches have divested either from coal alone or from fossil fuels. And yet many question as well whether this is the right approach uh, to take action against climate change. Harvard University's statement of October 2013 says that fossil fuel divestment is not, quote, warranted or wise, end quote, at this time for an academic institution, uh, saying that Harvard's commitment to fighting climate change comes through research, teaching, and other campus initiatives. And indeed, a few weeks ago, uh, Climate Week was all over campus and many discussions uh, going on. That was followed by Heat Week, in which uh, there were protests by students, alums, uh, and faculty about uh, the university position. So now we're out of Climate Week, we're out of Heat Week, and uh, we do have an opportunity tonight to listen, to learn, to have a thoughtful and constructive debate uh, and a dialogue about divestment from fossil fuels. And I would just like to stipulate from the beginning, I suspect it's not necessary, that we are not debating the science of climate change tonight. We are going to stipulate that we're all in agreement that the science showing that human activities, including the burning of fossil fuels, are the dominant cause of global climate change. We are debating what to do about it. What is the best means to a low carbon future for the planet? And what uh, is the end? And we're agreeing on the end, the need to reach that uh, low carbon future. And we will talk about what role divestment from fossil fuels will play in the fight to stop human-caused climate change. So we have an opportunity to take a fresh look at this issue uh, with insights from two uh, prominent Harvard professors, 
Speaking against divestment will be Rebecca Henderson, the John and Natty MacArthur University professor of Harvard University, and in favor of divestment, James Engel, Bernie Professor of English and Professor of Comparative Literature at Harvard University. Uh, Professor Hen Henderson, uh, needless to say, as you can see from these short uh, clips from her bio, has been strongly involved in both changing the climate in business towards sustainability and in also uh, changing uh, leading sustainable change. Her most recent book is Leading Sustainable Change and Organizational Perspective. She has been uh, the faculty co-chair of the Harvard Business School Initiative for Business and the Environment and very active in this field. James Engel uh, is active in the Harvard Faculty for Divestment. More than 250 faculty members have signed an open letter supporting divestment. His own writing on divestment has appeared in the Huffington Post and the Energy Collective. You might be wondering why a humanities professor is leading the debate in favor of divestment, but he has co-edited the widely used textbook Environment uh, and has written for and edited eight other books also a book, Saving Higher Education in the Age of Money, which won the Association of American Colleges and Universities Award. And he also has had a lifelong informal and formal interest in science and the connections between environment and other issues involving human values, expression, history, science, economics, and I think that about covers of the world. So tonight we're going to have three segments. We're going to start with the uh, pro and con arguments by our two professors. We'll have a session of follow-up questions and, and dialogue uh, among the panel, so to speak, and then we will have the Q&A uh, with you in the audience. I might add that this is being videotaped. Um, so uh, you should be aware of that uh, when you speak, and we uh, hope to get that up soon for on the uh, Belfer website uh, at the Kennedy School. And I'd also like to thank you in advance as an audience for helping me to maintain a stimulating, civil, and lively discussion this evening. And we will be trying to keep track of the time. And so I'd like to welcome uh, Uh, I might add, if any of you are in social media and Twitter, uh, I have designated divest debate as the hashtag for tonight. So I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Jim Engel uh, to argue in behalf of the uh, yes, Harvard should divest from fossil fuels. Good evening. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Henry, Tomas, and great thanks to the Kennedy School for this opportunity. Divestment is a rare and serious step. In my adult lifetime, Harvard has done it only three times. Divestment can be, if the movement grows, and it's growing rapidly, an effective way to raise public awareness, create pressure for better energy policies, spark significant social change, and begin to break the stranglehold that fossil fuel companies have on our energy and political systems. This year, a majority US Senate vote refused to confirm that human beings have anything to do with climate change. Fossil fuel companies state that they can't adequately combat climate change and provide energy competitively unless, according to BP, governments act to set a clear, stable, and effective carbon policy framework. But governments won't act unless there's public pressure and leadership from institutions regarded as ethical and educational. Harvard Faculty for Divestment calls for divestment as soon as possible, not immediately, knowing it might be phased in selectively over time. The university's absolute stance against all divestment 
stated October 2013, is regrettable. It doesn't square well with university commitments to sustainability or with its teaching and research. <coughs> Professor Henderson has stated publicly twice that Harvard well might divest from coal. She and I are debating, but we both want to move this conversation forward. The side I represent, I think, wants to move it forward faster because we think it's necessary. Divestment won't drive companies out of business. It repudiates their lopsided <coughs> political influence and their practices. As Donald Gould of Pitzer College's board says, divestment aims at policy makers. It's powerful, socially, and civically. It befits an educational, charitable organization. Merely considering it helps to redefine the reputations of these companies more in line with reality. Unlike divestment from tobacco and apartheid, however reprehensible, this divestment has a planetary alarm clock. We've overslept already. There's no snooze button. The fierce urgency of now is here. Every hour reducing emissions now is more important than any future hour because now gives impetus to the future. Many scientists, including Harvard scientists James Anderson, Jim McCarthy, and IPCC colleagues, have shown that slowing the feedback loops in Earth's cryosphere and climate systems grows harder each day and mitigation more expensive. Harm's being done. Island nations are disappearing. The WHO estimates that between 2030 and 2050, a quarter million people each year will die from conditions caused or worsened by climate disruption. That's equivalent to a Nepalese earthquake every week, week after week, for 20 years. Climate disruption hits the poorest the hardest. It cuts global GDP this year by 1.2 trillion. As research by Harvard colleague Naomi Orestes and others reveals, many of these companies actively denied and continue to deny human-caused climate change. They mangle science, encourage groundless doubt, employ surrogates, lobby hard at every governmental level, and fund questionable and have funded even bogus research. They're complicit in subverting the intellectual mission of this and other universities. Truth. Some have actively denied the results of research performed by academic appointees at this university. Renewable energy portfolio standards in 29 states are under attack from the fossil fuel industry and from power generators using fossil fuels. Shell Oil lobbied to undermine the EU's renewable energy targets. These companies spend enormous sums to locate new fossil fuel reserves, almost $2 billion a day worldwide. They do this often in environmentally sensitive and carbon intensive locales. No one denies that we can burn more than a modest fraction of present known reserves without breaking the two degrees centigrade rise Creating a climate disruption beyond that is an enormity. These companies contribute mightily to a political process that subsidizes but does not sufficiently regulate or tax them. They do so individually, but also through ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, the IPAA, the Independent Petroleum Association of America, and the American Petroleum Institute which is not exactly an institute like the Radcliffe Institute. <laughs> it speaks for many companies when it says it's working for a so-called secure energy future, quote, for generations to come, meaning fossil fuel for generations, a future that will grow increasingly insecure, as many, including the Pentagon, know. The API presents ads that make more generation of fossil fuels look patriotic. We are a superpower. Red, white, and blue explosions on the screen. In the meantime, they don't state that they're lobbying to export natural gas and drill more off of both coasts. Real hypocrisy raises its head 
not because one uses fossil fuels, albeit making all effort to cut emissions as much as possible, but rather when university endowments run counter to their own stated educational, moral, and research objectives. When the university strives with one hand to solve a profound problem while insisting that it is entirely free to profit from a driving cause of that problem, it suggests an unethical bet. Studies show that divesting would not damage the university. The prevailing business model of these companies is one that they are not changing. That's a big worry. Thank you. Uh, so, Professor Henderson uh, will now uh, speak in the negative, no, Harvard should not divest from fossil fuels. Christine, thank you very much. I'm honored and delighted to be here. Um, I'd like to start by getting a sense for the room. Jim has just given a most moving um, account of why we should divest. And let me begin by saying that I fully share his urgency about the nature of climate change. I fully share his concern about the behavior of companies who attempt to subvert the democratic process. But we, we disagree on a few details. So I'm going to ask you, please, those who are fully in agreement with, I'm going to ask you for three things. Full agreement with Jim, Harvard should divest as soon as possible all fossil fuels. People in real disagreement, like Harvard should not dis divest at all. And people in the middle who are like, hmm, I'm confused. So how many people right here with Jim, let's, let's do it, let's do it now. Come on, show me. Okay, how many people at the other end? I don't know, let's hold on, let's hold on. I'm not so sure, not so fast. That's the end. Like, like I, don't, I don't think we should divest. I think divesting is a mistake. So how many people think divesting? Yeah, but fairly quickly. Yeah. As soon as possible. As soon as possible, fairly quickly, yeah. People think divestment really, no, not a good tool. How about people in the middle? Pretty confused. So this is making me feel good, because I'm in the middle. I'm really pretty confused. My son and my partner are clear that divestment is the right thing to do, and they can't understand why I'm not like completely on board. My colleagues are most of them clear that divestment is not the right thing to do, and they can't understand why I would even consider being on board with divestment. And so I'm pretty confused. So I agreed to do this because I thought there's nothing like talking in public to make you work out what you think. <laughs> so let, let me... Uh, what I thought I would do is quickly lay, lay out the case against divestment, as I understand it, uh, talk briefly about whether we can deal with this case and how, and close with some ideas for what I think we might do. But you should know I'm right in that not knowing mind. Um, and one of the things that puzzles me about this debate is I think there's a lot we don't know. And so I'm puzzled by how clear people are on both sides, and my goal in being here this evening is to try and get us really to talk about this on the campus. Because Jim is entirely right. We don't have much time. This is the great problem for our age. We need to work out what's going to make a difference, and we need to work it out fairly quickly. So that's where I'm going in five minutes. OK. So firstly, the case against investment. <sighs> Climate change is a really hard problem. We had at the Harvard Business School this morning, Dan Schrag, one of the prominent climate scientists on campus, come and talk to our entire second year class who are about to go off into the world about climate change, about the nature of the challenge and about what's required to, to fix it. And he laid out for us in all its slightly depressing detail um, how long this is going to take, how much it's going to cost, and the nature of the significant public goods problem. So the core of the issue here is in order to solve this problem, we need to take actions now that will benefit our children and our children's children. And we are not so good at that as a society. And he said, you know, here's the problem. Um, fossil fuel, fairly cheap. Renewables coming down, still not quite there. 
and of course a strong incumbent fossil fuel system which is deeply embedded in the heart of our economy. And wait, it gets worse. We need the energy. We need the energy. If, if the developed world stopped emitting tomorrow, China and India on their current growth paths would take us over the edge. Because energy is essential to growth and they think, hey, it's our turn. So it's a really hard problem, first issue. Second issue, so what should the university do about it? So we're teaching like crazy, right? There are more than 300 courses. We're doing a great deal of research. Some of the best research in climate change was done right here on the campus. One of the leading experts on what the public policy should be is right here in this building and he has a bunch of colleagues. So the university is doing a bunch of teaching and research, investing really aggressively in taking down carbon emissions on the campus, really opening up the question. So um, that's good. That's, you know, the university is doing some stuff. But we need political pressure, and we need it soon. Right? If we're going to solve this, this commons problem, we need, I think, a mass social movement saying, we're willing to pay the price. We think we need to do it. So here's the question. Does divestment do that? That seems to me the central question. And does divestment do that at a, um, without the risk to the, that the university's mission in teaching and research will be seriously undermined? That, that seems to me to be the central question. So let's think about the financial risk to the university. Fossil fuels are approximately 25% of the S&P 500, so divesting from all fossil fuels is a big deal. It's not a small thing to do. Um, I'm not a finance professor, but you know, on average, you're taking off the table something in the portfolio that is you know, 25% of the portfolio and could give you returns. One might well say, we don't want to touch the money. You know, and my son will say to me, mom, you don't want the money. You don't want the money that's coming from fossil fuel. You, know, you shouldn't even be using it. One minute. Wow, okay. So there's a financial risk. There's a political risk. Harvard is already tagged as an elitist institution out of touch with the rest of the country. Does divesting play into that political risk? Does it play into the idea that we are not an impartial institution? Do we open ourselves up to attack from the right? So that, I think, is why the so-called rational mind hesitates about divestment. Let me make the emotional case. Here's the emotional case. We need to build a movement. How do you build a movement? You build a movement by individual action. Don't use slave-grown sugar. Taking local action, build a, a, a petition to the, uh, to the parliament. National action, change the policy. So does divestment build that local capacity? Does it build that sense of moral urgency? I think the answer is yes, it does. No question. My question is, is it wise to divest everything I think we should be targeted. These firms are different. We're going to need gas for the transition. We're going to need oil for several years. I think we should certainly divest coal, but we should take to divest all fossil fuels is to use a very blunt hammer on a difficult problem. Let us take a scattershot approach. Let's have clear criteria. Firms that mess with the political process, we don't want to invest in them. Let's get out of those firms. Firms that play clean, firms that play well, we need those firms to help us through the, through the transition. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll, we'll have now a rebuttal from Professor Engel, three minutes. Although they're being very efficient with their time, so we're gonna have plenty of time um, for questions. Thank you. The call for divestment is as soon as possible, not immediately, knowing, as I said, it might be phased in selectively over time. It would be unwise, certainly, just to do it at the snap of a finger. Those institutions that have decided to do it have timetables and they have criteria. Harvard would need to have that, too. I wish Harvard were in the middle with Professor Henderson. It's not. It has made an absolute statement against all divestment and has done so without limit of time. Will these companies change? Engagement hasn't worked. Harvard has signed up 
to the carbon disclosure product pro, um, project and to the principles for responsible investment. One faculty colleague called the CDP and the PRI, and this is a colleague who's worked in the energy industry for decades, he called them utterly worthless. The Rockefeller Brothers Fund tried for a decade to engage privately with their clout. They finally walked away frustrated and announced they will divest. A British environmentalist, Jonathan Porritt, said, these are companies whose senior managers know as an irrefutable fact that their current business model threatens the stability of the global economy and the longer term prospects of humankind. I think if a university divests, it needs to do it with great care. It needs to have a plan. It needs to develop a plan. Apparently, for example, Brandeis is doing that. It just announced that a committee that it formed to discuss has recommended that Brandeis look into divestment for the entire university. That's just one more university. Now, the fossil fuel companies, I wish, were moving in the direction Professor Henderson hopes they will, but I worry they aren't. The sad thing is, they could. If Harvard wants to engage and to invest at the same time, let it invest in companies that, one, openly lobby for a carbon tax, two, no longer spend capital to find new reserves that we can't burn, three, have plans and practices that comport with a two degrees centigrade temperature elevation limit, and four, better still, if they also start doing real investment in renewables. All right, we'll have uh, Professor Henderson for rebuttal. Jim, you sound wonderfully thoughtful and grounded. And so I want to open a political question for you which is if the goal is to get Harvard to divest, is this entirely the right strategy? And let me suggest a couple of ideas. One, I think we should focus hard on coal. I think coal is a huge problem. If we could get coal out of the energy stream, we would make an enormous difference in the next 20 years. I think it's technically possible, and I think we should put an enormous amount of energy against it. Secondly, as I said, I think we should definitely call out bad behavior by the fossil fuel companies. But we should do more than suggest that simply divesting will solve this issue. I think we should all, as individuals, take a pledge of some kind. To be carbon neutral, or to tell ten friends, or to really make a costly action of our own. I think we should talk and talk hard about other demands at Harvard. Maybe we think that everyone should take a course exploring climate change. Maybe we think the research budget should be tripled. Let us be clear, if we think divestment is important, that we also value and appreciate the teaching and research mission of the university and wish to support it in every way we can. Because if tomorrow all these institutions divested, we would still have so much work to do. And so as a movement, if that's what we care about, we should be clear about what else remains to be done, about what the strategy is for dealing with China and India. As I said, I agree with you completely in divesting coal. I think we should be very clear on our investment criteria. I think we should also be clear that that is not enough. We have a great deal of work to do. And sometimes divestment can seem like a form of moral licensing that if they divest, everything will be fixed. That's something they can do. Divestment is very serious action, as Jim said. It puts the university at some financial risk. That might be well worth taking, but we should be clear that that is true. It might put the university at some significant political risk. It might well be worth doing, but we should be clear that that is the case. This is not an easy choice. We need to make it in all its depth, and complexity, and most importantly, if we think this is the case, we need to build a mass movement on this campus. 
What will drive change is hundreds and thousands of people. That's what the politicians respond to, I think. Not the university saying, oh, we divest. It's that force of moral commitment that drives change. And that's what we need to think how to do. I don't know why that's happening, but thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of follow-up questions. You raised the question of divesting from coal, and I wondered what, Jim, you would respond about how strong that is as a start, what your feelings are on behalf of the kind of larger divestment question, and also on behalf of the university, since Stanford University did take that approach. I think any step that's positive is a good step to take. And I don't think it's a question of either or. So yes, I would say by all means, if you want to begin somewhere, begin with coal. It makes most sense because burning coal is the dirtiest, least healthful, most CO2 producing of the fossil fuels. It makes good sense. That's a, a wonderful place to start. But I think it's also true that Professor Henderson talks about the political capture that exists by the fossil fuel industry as a whole. And I think we need to do something about that. But I think it should be also very clear that those who favor divestment are doing many other things as well. They are teaching courses. I'm teaching a course right now. Talk very little about divestment in that course. Doing research. Doing things individually, personally. Reducing their own fossil fuel input. Looking at their own investments. That is to say, divestment doesn't create some sort of moral magi magic circle into which no other activity enters. Far from it. It's an additional tool. It's not a tool that says the others aren't important. It's a tool that basically says, this is added leverage, this is added pressure. And Professor Henderson, uh, on the coal issue, maybe explaining, since this is trying to get people clear on what that means to do that, obviously there are the health benefits because coal is a very dirty fuel. Can you talk a little bit more about why you have endorsed that approach and also whether you have heard anything about that approach uh, being discussed for Harvard in terms of divestment. So I cannot speak to the administration's viewpoint on this. I have no special insight in that. Um, why focus on coal? So you said, of course, the health benefits. But the health benefits really make a difference. Coal kills hundreds of thousands of people every year and um, is um, about twice as carbon intensive as the next fuel, which is gas. If we burn all the coal that's available to burn, um, the consequences would be completely catastrophic. So there's both a health reason, a scientific reason, and let me suggest a political reason, which is um, the coal industry is relatively small. I believe we can make the case that it is immoral to burn coal for health reasons as well as climate reasons. I think we can talk and would need to talk carefully and clearly about transitioning uh, people who work in the coal industry. I think it's very important not to seem to demonize people who've been making a living in a way that was legal, in a way that they understood for many years. So we would need to think about a transition strategy for people working in difficult areas of the country. Um, I think the development of technologies to replace coal and making those technologies available in, in other um, localities is absolutely critical. So in, um, in divesting from coal, we make clear that coal should not be part of the transition, and then we begin the hard task of putting renewables in place at scale. Professor Engel, could you uh, spell out really for the audience a little bit more about what the tangible benefits would be of divestment by Harvard, by other universities, given the huge impact of fossil fuels around the world. So, you know, some have criticized it as being more symbolic. How would you argue both the importance of taking this approach as well as the tangible uh, impact? Well, I would say first, yes, it is symbolic. I think it's more than that, because every important symbolic act leads to other acts and leads to acts that aren't purely symbolic. I would say with regard to divestment itself as an act or even as a consideration, that during the last two years, 
and not just in the United States alone, the single most important factor driving the climate debate forward in favor of a low or zero carbon energy future has been the divestment movement and the divestment debate. I can't think of a single other more important factor. And then all of the decisions by three dozen universities, many municipalities, pension funds, investments, individuals, these are all having an effect. They are helping to build a social movement. And I think for that reason, divestment is important. Now, the tangible benefit, we are looking at a, at a long time scale here. We're looking at a time scale that goes down to the middle or late part of the century. So it's extremely hard to predict exactly what will happen. There are no guarantees here. No one can guarantee that divestment will solve the problem. No one can guarantee that any particular thing is going to solve this problem. But every great movement in recent human history has come about through a self-actuated awareness of individuals who felt blocked out in some way from the present power system, got together and decided that they would first move symbolically in order finally to create a new system. Divestment has provided that catalyst. Can I add to that? Because I completely agree with Jim that symbolic action is, is critically important. Let me talk about why, and let me talk about whether divestment is the best or the only symbolic action. So, as he says, every great movement that has demanded real change in a dominant system has been morally inspired. This is not okay. Let's think about slavery, let's think about temperance, let's think about the Tea Party. And what has happened in all three cases? People in those movements have said something is going on that is not all right. And I'm willing to put myself on the line to say it's not all right. I take individual action. In the slave case, I don't use slave sugar in England. In the temperance case, I take the pledge. In the Tea Party case, I promise not to, uh, you know, to have any of the dark dealings of, of, uh, of relying on government. Um, and then I do something locally. So in the temperance case, I try and shut down the local saloon. In the Tea Party case, I try and control the local school board. So the question is, is divestment the ideal thing for that. So I tell you what I would like to see. I'd like to see, I mean, let's go after the coal companies. Let's chain ourselves to the railings. Let's demand renewable fuel standards in the local community. Let's take action in the local community as well as in addition to divestment. I think that's really important. The danger for me of divestment is it's something that they will do. Most of these actions, like get on the school board, close down the saloon, you had to go and stand there and you had to do that. So a little bit that worries me about divestment is it's something like the institutions are doing. As I say, I think Harvard should divest from coal, but I think this movement, if it's to succeed, should be mobilizing people to, you know, like mothers out front, let's get people down to the state house, let's demonstrate. And that's a really important part of this transition as well. I think if all the institutions just tomorrow said we divest and it didn't give people a chance to really engage in this kind of grassroots stuff, wouldn't uh, wouldn't work. I'm sorry, thank you. I get excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to follow up on that, what should society, you're talking about coal and action there, but in the larger picture with fossil fuel, oil and gas, what should society or even Harvard University be pushing, if, if you don't think divestment overall is the best strategy, what would be some strategies for pushing for better action and also uh, more uh, efforts to move in the low carbon direction? So I'm glad you asked me that, because after the talk by Don, Dan Schrag at the, at the business school this morning, we all broke into small groups, and uh, all the second year MBAs discussed, well, what can we do? So what can we do? First, efficiency. We can double the efficiency of this economy and most economies. So um, what my students told me is every firm should take a thousand tiny steps. Increase efficiency, move to renewables wherever possible, um, continually think creatively about how to use less carbon. So we can do that right now. 
The study suggests that fuel efficiency is NPV positive, oh, sorry, means we'll make money um, in a very high fraction of, of cases. So we can make huge difference. Second big step, new technologies. I'm a huge nuclear booster. That might be a problem in this room. The trouble with solar and wind is it's intermittent. And so you can back up solar and wind with gas-fired power plants. That's going to be necessary to get coal out of the system. But then we have to get the gas out of the system. And to do that, we're going to need both major breakthroughs in storage and full-scale nuclear. Um, Fourth-generation nuclear uses waste, creates no waste of its own. So we burn the existing waste. We create no waste of its own. And it's uh, passive safety. So if all the power fails and the water fails, it's still safe. Very small scale, controllable by local communities, gives us distributed power grids. At MIT right now, they're working on scaling it up. So we need to be funding R&D as aggressively as we can. And last, last, we need a price for carbon. We need to price in the fact that these, um, these technologies impose costs on our children and our children's children. We need to be lobbying for that as hard as we can, as strong as we can. Divestment is a path towards, if it works, a path towards a price for carbon. And that's what we need to be united on as a community, is that's the transition path. And then, Jim, do you think that puts enough pressure on the fossil fuel industry? Well, I think I just heard Professor Henderson said divestment might do that, which would be a really good thing. I think it might do it, too. I, I think that uh, people who are in favor of divestment, my experiences, are doing a lot of other things. I mean, Mothers Out Front is headed by Kelsey Wirth, and Kelsey and Tim Wirth are great supporters of divestment. Um, I would be happy to see nuclear plants uh, go up of a fourth generation, but it's going to take a lot of time to build those plants, and there'll be a lot of legal opposition to them in many places. So I still and, and in this country, oh, and in it's this country, not, not a no, it's an not a active starter. industry. It's, no, it's there's really one new nuclear plant under construction right. in the United States at the present time. And by the time that's done, then we'll probably see decommissioning of others in motion. So, the United States, I don't think that's a starter. Elsewhere, yes, I think it may be, and uh, we hope that they do it safely. But I think I think that. Um, one of the great worries I have is that the prevailing business models of large fossil fuel companies seem uh, stuck. Uh, they seem increasingly pure play hydrocarbon dinosaurs, as one British environmentalist put it. And many young people who are interested in turning them around to another direction have apparently been ousted. It's an industry, perhaps more than any other, that has ingrown management and an old boy network. It is an extremely difficult industry to change. Exxon Mobil and BP both forecast that 80% of the world's primary energy in 2035 is going to come from fossil fuels. And when Exxon Mobil recalculated that in 2040 more energy would be needed, they said, well, that'll come from oil. So I think the long term thinking here is unfortunate. You know, Professor Henderson knows from studying GM that it's possible for a company to ignore the handwriting on the wall until it's too late. I worry that that's exactly what's happening with these companies. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to move in to questions from the audience. And somewhere we have two microphones. And uh, again, I'd like to have some ground rules here. Uh, could we have you state your name and your affiliation and also uh, ask a question? We don't have time tonight for long statements, um, as much as I'm sure everybody in this room has a lot to say. Uh, but I'd like to start first with the Harvard Kennedy School students, um, of which I've seen a number in the audience, including some of my uh, recent students. So. Uh, I'm going to call on my students. Hello, I'm Brian Renault. I'm a student here, as the professor just said. Um, so Professor Henderson, I'm one of those people on the fence. Um, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, because everybody here is taking time after work, when they could be home uh, with their families, to kind of learn more about this. Uh, so you said that divestment is, uh, 
a sledgehammer when, when we should be using a scalpel. And in theory, I agree with that. But I wonder if a scalpel is strong enough to get someone's attention, to get the American public's attention. Uh, I went to a liberal arts college for undergrad. I know it was very frustrating how hard it is to get people engaged. They're so overwhelmingly busy. And you know, the fact that there's you know, less than 100 people in here or something says that the entire Harvard University campus is not as engaged on this as you might think. Isn't divestment a good way to get people's attention? So I think you're asking an absolutely central question. And the reason I'm talking about things like chaining ourselves to the fence at a major oil fund company in Houston and going down to the state house and lobbying our colleagues to stop eating meat and tell me how much are you flying, here's how much I'm flying, are we buying offsets? I think we need a range of techniques to really raise interest um, because you're right. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm the best they could find to do the anti-case, you know, case, and I'm like really, really engaged because there's lots of people on the campus who are like, you know, somebody else will deal with it or it's going to take too long. Or, so the question of how we really get people engaged um, seems to me the deep and important question here. And um, I think to the degree we can see small local wins, to the degree that we can really call out. I'm, so I'll tell you my favorite strategy. I'm, yeah. <coughs> my favorite strategy is to call out the firms that are doing the right thing. So Jim knows I've done a bunch of work on GM, and GM was problematic. But Toyota was amazing. And so we need to find the firms that are at the leading edge the utilities that are committed to 30% renewables in the next 10 years and 60% 20 years further on. The energy companies that are really trying to make that um, transition. We have a company founded by Roger Sant, who's a very prominent environmentalist who funded a, com founded a company called ACS. And his first move was to buy two million trees to offset the uh, power from his coal plants. You know, we need to call out companies like that. We need to show it's possible. We need to really support them. And, and it, we have to have hope as well as despair. And uh, thanks, great question. Do you have a comment or should we move on? Well, I do have a, a quick comment. I, mean, I think one of the explanations that's often given why divestment is not the right tool is that one should engage with companies. Well, that sounds pretty good, but I've given a couple of examples where engagement didn't work so well and big, experienced investors finally walked away. I'll give an example about Harvard. Harvard says it wants to engage. Read the Corporation Committee shareholder responsibility reports for the last few years. They're online. They're open for anybody to read. I find that action rather weak. I would call it really pinpricks in the hide of a rhino. Uh, I'm not convinced that this is going to change the behavior of any company. There is one company uh, that did its carbon disclosure project report. Its emissions have actually gone up in the last year. It doesn't even measure its emissions outside the U.S. because it's not required to. It left lots of questions blank on the CDP report. Uh, it has not one word about renewables in the entire report. The only time it mentions sustainability is in the titles of people who are mandated to do compliance with government regulations. That's not real sustainability, I think. So that's an interesting company. That's a company that Harvard decided newly to invest almost $60 million in last fall. That's a company whose president, when he came to Harvard, said, depends what your religion on climate is. And he said it in, of all places, the Science Center. Um, another uh, question from a student. Yes, up there. Yeah, you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Hi, uh, I'm Sebastian. I'm, uh, Dual degree student between Sebastian, could you give us your last name too? Sorry, I'm Sebastian Sela. I'm a dual degree student between Stanford's Business School and, and the Kennedy School. Uh, and actually, before coming to Kennedy School, I worked for Yale's Investments Office. So, spent a lot of time thinking about this from the university's Investments Office side of things. Um, and so, I'd be curious if, if, if both of you think that 
the nature of the type of investments that universities and endowments have in fossil fuel companies should affect this decision, this conversation. Mainly, I, I wonder how many people really kind of think of the types of companies that Harvard or Yale are investing. Is it really the shells of the world and the PPs, or is it kind of smaller private oil and gas companies in Texas? And so, whether that difference should be something to think about, how should we think about it, whether we should think about kind of the influence that we as an endowment might be able to have in these varying kind of um, companies depending on their size and, and where their location is. So I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, and both, both of your thoughts. <laughs> That's a very good question. And let me say it's hard to <coughs> tell exactly what the right answer is because one doesn't know what the investments actually are. Uh, I would say the answer to your question is yes, of course it would depend on exactly what these companies are doing. It would depend what their business plans are and whether you can really believe in them. It would depend on whether you think they're really sustainable or not. But you know, Harvard has a lot of different investment in instruments. They actually don't have all that much in SEC publicly posted, publicly traded, publicly available knowledge company investments. It's a remarkably small amount. Instead, their investments in all kinds of private equity, their investments in all kinds of vehicles Harvard used to have, may still have offshore companies it invests through. It's a very complex, sophisticated, elaborate investment regime. You would have to go through that regime in order to determine the full answer to your question. I have every confidence that those smart people could do that if they were asked to. So for me, the, the critical issue is not whether an oil company is investing in renewables. For me, the question is, is the oil company actively denying climate science when it itself believes the science is true? Is it attempting to subvert the political process in ways contrary to the public good? Um, and that's tricky, right? If you're a Republican, you may say, you know, no, a carbon price is going to be implemented badly. I really think it's not aligned with the public good. Um, and, and we could disagree on that. But I think we, as Harvard, we would want to be investing in companies that were completely transparent about their political activity, completely transparent about their beliefs, and uh, would agree to go on record to be transparent in that way. Um, and that, that would be my first concern. And, and just to follow up, it, it is a little bit hard, I think, Syracuse University, they're talking about uh, direct investment. So it is, when you get into the details of divestment, um, you don't necessarily get your arms around. Um, no, no, you don't. I mean, they're direct and they're indirect investments, but you know, there are people who devote their lives to sorting these things out, and they, they're paid very well. And I have no doubt that they can sort these things out according to whatever criteria they're asked. I mean, Professor Henderson's criteria are very good criteria. I'm not sure who that leaves standing exactly, but they're very, very good criteria. So the Church of England just persuaded BP to adopt these criteria. Um, and, uh, and so that would be an, in a, an example of engagement that, that did work. Well, we, we hope so, although I must say that on things like the Carbon Disclosure Project, when it asks, is there any third party verification or assessment, the answer is always no. So then you keep pressing. I think we're just at the beginning of a stakeholder control, um, stakeholder engagement with companies. If you look at what's happened in the extractive mineral, the extractive industry and the pressure on human rights, I think it's beginning to make real progress. The thing is, we need these companies. We need the oil. We need the gas. We, the, I think our, our, our pressure should be to bring them to be good actors in our political and social system. Uh, I'm going to take uh, a couple more students and then throw uh, yeah. Hi, uh, Will Torres. I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. So uh, from what I'm hearing, um, the cost of divestment to the university would be, if not done carefully, it's a blunt instrument that could uh, carry, it, you know, uh, carry other companies that may not deserve uh, the being divested from. 
and also it risks alienating the university as, uh, as an out-of-touch elite institution. Um, are there other costs to the university? Or it, it, seems, it sounds like we, Harvard has done divestment in the past, so there's precedent to divesting from certain areas. What are the other costs that the administration would be taking into consideration? So let me go first with that, because I'm sure Jim's thought de deeply about this problem and will certainly disagree with me. Um, so I think there are two important costs. The first is financial. So if you move to take out a very significant class of the economy from your portfolio, you would reduce diversification and everything we know leads to believe that you run the risk of reducing returns. The um, endowment currently funds 30% of Harvard's operating budget. So the question is, how much money would you put against divestment as opposed to, say, increasing teaching or scholarship or research in this area? The second major cost, and I, th I think it's a very or the potential cost, the second risk is the po perceived politicization of the university. That the university is one of the few institutions which is not riven by deep polarization, which ideally does research that speaks to the central issue of the day. The difference to me in this case, in the South African and the tobacco cases, there was clear social consensus that apartheid was a bad thing and that tobacco really caused cancer. We do not have such a consensus in this society at this time. The risk is for Harvard to take a position to, to divest is for people to say, see, we told you you were political bastards. We told you the research was skewed. We told you you're controlled by liberals. That, to me, would be a huge cost. Because to me, the central mission of the university is science that is real science. And if we play into this, know all the science is skewed narrative, the risk is we delegitimize the university. And I think that's a major risk. I would say there are risks. One risk is the possible alienation of certain donors. Another risk is that it's possible that fossil fuel companies who fund research, as they have here at Harvard, might decide that they didn't want to fund research uh, of programs or individuals. There are studies, quite a few studies, that show that divesting in publicly traded stocks without fossil fuels over the last decade would not have lost you money. Now, if you go back to the 1960s, it would have. In fact, from 1988 to 2005, a portfolio without fossil fuel stocks did just as well as the Russell 3000. That's not too bad. There's no guarantee of future performance, of course. But uh, I don't think there's a lot of um, sense out there that can argue convincingly that it is some kind of guaranteed hit financially to pull fossil fuel stocks out of your portfolio. Um, you know, some very savvy business people who don't think so, Bevis Longstreth, a Harvard law grad who was twice appointed SEC chairman by Ronald Reagan, has urged Harvard to divest. I don't think he'd be doing it if he thought Harvard was going to take a financial bath on it. Um, and questions? I'm looking for a woman to ask a question. <laughs> And here we are, and uh, if you'd identify yourself, thank you. I'm Jane Mansbridge, and I'm a thank you. I'm, I'm Jane Mansbridge, I'm a professor here at the Kennedy School. Um, and I'd like to ask Professor Henderson um, a question about the political issue. And by the way, I really appreciate your honesty, your decency, and your commitment. Um, I think this is a wonderful debate, and I think everybody here is trying to make sense of a difficult problem. So I think the political issue is uh, an important one. And I study social movements, among other things, and uh, it seems to me the political scene today uh, poses a collective action problem. And f a first mover is going to take uh, the biggest hit. 
Um, and uh, we've already had a few first movers. Harvard isn't a first mover. But if Harvard were to divest, I would give cover to people who came afterwards. And once people came afterwards, they would give cover to Harvard, so to speak. In other words, if Stanford were to go further than coal, um, and the fact that Stanford's already done coal gives Harvard cover. Um, you know, now Stanford, you might say, is a left-wing leaning university, et cetera, et cetera. But the more universities get on board, the less you can say of any one of them that they're a left-wing university. So Harvard's taking a position might help start a cascade, which would then ironically come possibly back and protect Harvard. So that's, a, then it's, and so I kind of wonder about the, and then in, in regard to the dynamics of a social movement, I don't think it's zero sum. I think it's the more, the more. That, um, that if Harvard were to divest, I think it would make it more likely that people would chain themselves to corporate. Uh, and I'm asking you whether you think it would make it less likely. If Harvard divested, would people then just go home and say, oh well, Harvard's divested, we don't have to do anything more? Or would they say, this is a signal that yes, the social movement that we all hope for is happening, and we will go and do something uh, further. So I'm kind of asking about your perception of these dynamics. So first, I, I hesitate to answer your question, given you've spent your lifetime studying social movements. <laughs> Whoa, OK. So let me answer the first, which I have much stronger beliefs about. Um, when I'm talking to my students about how to make a difference against these problems, I strongly suggest collective action to overcome collective action problems. So that rather than being the only firm to say, I, I, I will only buy sustainable palm oil, you try and get a group of firms to go in with you. So if you're suggesting as one possible strategy to get a group of universities, which would most importantly include some of the southern and midwest universities, um, if, if possible, um, because we, we have, as you know, a very nasty polarization in this country. If there was a way to do it that was um, much more general, I think that would be fantastic. Um, if, if there was, and I think you're right, that it's possible that Harvard would trigger a cascade, it's entirely possible the risks that I've outlined are minimal and that the effects would be immediate and dramatic and would have this follow-on effect. I simply want to signal that it's also possible that others would not follow and that the political and financial costs would be significant and counterproductive. Uh, Jim, would you respond and also, since this has been going on as a movement at the university for a few years, have you sensed any rolling forward and, and could you address this interesting question? Well, I have sensed a rolling Forward. Actually, I think it's something that more and more people are talking about. Um, I would say, going back just a minute, that no matter what Harvard does, it's going to take flack, and always has. And there are always going to be people who say things about the university that are critical. Um, the very good study of divestment movements done at Oxford by the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment a detailed study of all divestment movements. They conclude that the divestment movement for fossil fuels is the fastest moving divestment mu movement that has been established. And they studied a lot. They studied not only apartheid and tobacco, they studied divestment from alcohol and divestment from businesses that do pornography and you name it, a very thorough study. And their feeling is that Yes, you are taking a risk because you're not sure who's going to follow you, but if you don't lead, no one is going to follow you at all. And that's what social movements are, in fact, all about. Abolitionists in the middle of the 19th century were a fringe group. They were considered by many to be lunatics. They weren't really welcome in any political party to speak up for a long while. Things change. And I think it's entirely possible that the momentum of the divestment movement, which is growing, and of course it's varied, some people far more militant than others in it, but its overall momentum has changed the conversation. And it has gotten more people interested in the problem and in solving the problem in as many possible ways as there are. Thank you. Uh, yes, a student. I don't know if you're a student, sorry, the, the uh, gentleman in the back. Hello, uh, thank you for giving me this chance to ask a question. 
Uh, my name is Shin Chai Zhang. I'm actually the founder of my uh, science and culture company called My Lab Tea. Uh, my question is, uh, let's say we talk about the climate change, and let's an estimate that if there's uh, a rise of two degrees worldwide, there will be huge problems. So uh, nowadays there's a debate on how to control climate change and how to, let's say, from a global view, let's say each country or each nation should take uh, the percentage on controlling the carbon uh, emission. And so there are some people say that it should be that some uh, developed country take certain steps to reduce the carbon emission. But there's also some, uh, some people believe that uh, it should be, uh, let's say, let's say China, India, and those uh, developing countries, they have more population and they are under the development, in the, in the development proce uh, process. So uh, how many percentage or how to divide each, let's say, each, com each country that they uh, know percentage on the climate change? This is one question. The other question is, let's say, do you have some specific uh, suggestions for China as a new developing country? on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'll take a shot at that. I mean, China's actually doing a great deal already. It's producing a huge amount of wind energy. It's, uh, I think, the world's largest manufacturer of solar cells. It's moving very quickly. It understands the problem. It knows that in northern China, the average lifespan of an individual is cut five years by air pollution. Um, I, I think China understands this problem and is moving on it. Now, yes, it means that China has a lot of people who need more development as well. What's going to be key in all of this is things like the Paris Climate Talks later this year. There's going to have to be an international framework that's going to come to an agreement of some of the kinds of issues that you discussed. We've had attempts at these agreements in the past. Some have worked out better than others. But time is getting short. We need a real commitment to that two degree centigrade. And we need everybody openly and transparently on board for it, not waiting on the sidelines to see if governments will do it, not betting that politicians are too cowardly to come together. There has to be pressure for that kind of international agreement. Without it, we're not going to get where we need to be. Uh, developed nations are going to need to make some kind of sacrifices, which I think they can look at in terms of an insurance policy. You'll pay a few percentage of points on your income to have an insurance policy against burning your house down. The Stern Report a few years ago said if countries would put 3% of their GDP toward real climate control, that that would be enough to mitigate the serious effects predicted. We haven't done that, but I think it's possible to do it. Uh, the problem goes back to the ticking clock. We have been talking about solutions of this kind for 15 to 20 years, and we haven't really yet implemented serious ones. So let's hope that Paris succeeds. So uh, let's, when we, speaking of ticking clock, um, could we have a few more questions? Um, let me see who's had their hand up. Yeah. Yes, you. Um, hi, Alexandra Vischer. I'm a, a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. And, and full disclosure, I just took a great class across the river with Professor Henderson. Um, and so building on Professor Mansbridge's comments about social movements and, and Harvard leading the way, I mean, one of the things we talk a lot about is, so is there a business case for doing something, and is there a values case for doing something? And how are you building support for this action? And I wonder if it's not necessarily about Harvard leading the way, but getting people on board at the same time. And if these conversations ha are happening and have been continuing to happen, but nothing is changing, I'd be interested in both of your perspectives on what more or different could be done, not on stakeholder engagement on the firm side, but on the university side. If we know that there's a business case, right? Um, that we can inoculate against some of the financial concerns, and if you think that there is protection against the political risk that comes from strength in numbers at the outset, um, what kinds of opportunities do you think might be there? 
So is your question if I were trying to get the student and faculty body at Harvard as a whole really engaged with these issues, how would I do it? Yeah, so two, two things. One, the student and faculty body, and then two, universities universities around the country. I just did a quick, uh, a quick scan, my undergrad at Berkeley. Like, I don't think that we have, I mean, we have other financial concerns, right? But it's more or different than just Stanford and just Harvard, right? Where is the collective action amongst higher education across the country? So sort of two pieces there. Right. I, I think that's a question that all of us who've thought seriously about how to really get things rolling on this are grappling with. I'll give you some ideas, they're only ideas. Um, if it were me, I would have discussion groups in all the living groups. I would train people who really understand science, and I would bring in people who are starting to suffer already from climate change, either by video or in person, so I would try and make it real. Um, I would try and talk people through the science. Many people have not sat down and really grappled with the science. The risk is you fall into despair. It's just too big, too, I, I can't do anything. So I would explain the science, show what can be done, um, and give people concrete actions that they can take right now. And I think that has to be done small group by small group by small group. Um, and simultaneously, at the university level, I would do the kind of thing we're trying to do at the business school, which is everyone in the second year is exposed to these ideas, has the chance to talk about them. I don't know. <laughs> the world is telling me to be quiet. So, um, that, that would be a beginning. The collective across universities, I think once you've had all the universities roused, it would be easier to get collective action. I'd answer that by making three suggestions. That The first I hope will happen, but I suspect it won't. Harvard could make a statement that's saying it is reconsidering its policy of a year and a half ago and that it's going to conduct some internal conversations in the way that other universities have. It's going to bring in people with different points of view. It's going to establish a committee. It's going to set a deadline for that committee to report. And that could be something done internally, a real internal conversation, not private conversations that are unstructured. Secondly, I think the university should require students to have some component of environmental education no matter what school they're in. And I think FAS missed the boat when it didn't include that in general education. Third, I think higher education should have a collective summit on this issue. I think some leaders in higher education should call together their peers, announce that summit, bring together researchers and educators, make it a, an important affair, get media attention focused on it, and really talk about it. That isn't to say that it should be a showcase for divestment, but by the same token, it shouldn't exclude the topic of divestment. I think if those things were done, it would raise public awareness, it would get the debate going, it would educate people more, and it would not shut divestment out. A couple more questions. Um, Yes, here. Yes. Uh, microphone. Thank you. My, my question, I'm Paul Nader. I'm a graduate of the uh, business school many, many years ago. My question is for Professor Engel, uh, and I'm, I'm against divestment. And we're um, going to have to have really quick questions and quick really, answers. Uh, it's going to be a, a really quick question. Thanks. I'm unpersuaded. This whole discussion is not about doing other things. We should do all the other things you suggest. Absolutely. We should all be doing many things. Nobody disagrees about the problem in this room anyway. It's about tactics. This is narrowly, canonically about tactics. And it's my view that divestment would neither do the good things that its proponents suggest, nor the bad things its opponents suggest. Returns would not change for the Harvard down in material. The, our reputation as elitism would not change. We've got, a, we've got an admissions office. Of course we are. Uh, if, if fossil fuels were eliminated this minute, Right? Within 60 days, not 250,000, millions of people would die. We'd have no heat, no transportation, no ambulances, no hospitals, nothing. So we've got to change engines. The question is coming. Question. Engines <laughs> in mid -flight. Oh, It's complicated. And divesting from the problem is not the same as investing in the solution. Would you not prefer that we become vocal activist shareholders? that we say we are pulling our money out of coal, we're putting it in BP because that's a progressive company. 
we are selecting sorry, certain we, energy can, companies who are moving we, in the right direction and walking sir? away from ones who are not, and supporting them very publicly. Yeah, I, I would like us to become more active as shareholders, but we haven't. We don't, I think, have a very good track record in it. Moreover, being an activist shareholder doesn't mean you succeed at all. A lot of the resolutions that Harvard supported, by the way, it didn't, as far as I can tell, initiate any of them. It simply supported them. Didn't, didn't win. The companies themselves didn't support them. Uh, there has been a long history of engagement by very smart people with these companies and they have walked away saying that engagement was getting nowhere. Now, if Harvard is willing to continue engaging, I would say you really must ramp up that engagement because the history in the last five to ten years, going back and reading those reports, that is not something that is shifting these companies. It just, as far as I can see, isn't. And maybe the Church of England, which owned an awful lot of stock in the company, actually. But I don't think Harvard uh, uh, has has a kind of track record there that uh, one can bet on in the future. Thanks. Um, question here. No, um, no the yeah, young lady to your left. Well, all right. Each of you, these are the last probably two questions because we want a little wind up. How about that? So I'm Anna St. Hilary. I'm at the Ed School. And um, it sounds like both of you agree that Harvard should divest from coal, at least. Uh, perhaps more in the future, perhaps not at all in the future, but at least from coal. What do you think it's going to take for Harvard to divest from coal? Because there doesn't, if, I agree with you, Professor Engel, that there's some talk about it, but there doesn't seem to be much movement from the university. So what is it going to take? And what do you think the, the role of the people here in this room is in order to express their point of view to Harvard that they should divest in coal? Quick answers. I'll, 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 I'll try that first. Two sentences each. Yeah, two sentences each. Well, I think it means alumni and faculty and students asking for that to happen and not stopping asking until it's done. The university responds to its own constituents alumni, faculty, and students. And when they make that case, after a while, it's very hard to resist. That's what I believe. But not by the hundred, by the thousands. Good. Uh, all right, a question from you as well. Yeah, I'm Harvey Cox. I'm from the Divinity School. I'm also one of the faculty, 240 faculty now, who signed a letter. Can, can she give you the mic just so we can? Yes. And yes. Thank you. Uh, I also want to commend uh, the, the participants in the panel for their, their reasonable and civil approach to a question which is not always discussed that way. And I have a, a suggestion to make about the next steps to take here. First of all, to Professor Henderson, I would have been helped if you had not what I took to be kind of caricatured the possible positions. The first thing you said was, how many people here think we should divest the like that. Uh, that was, uh, he was uh, uh, just like that. How many are in the middle and how many are against? That let me out. Because like Jim Engel, I don't suggest a pit, pit, pit like that. I think this is a process that we have to enter into uh, and, uh, and it, it, it clarifies things if it isn't caricatured in that way. Um, the, also, the, the, frequently you use the word only or best and even suggested at times that you know, people in, in the divestment movement aren't doing other things. I don't know anybody in the divestment movement who isn't doing lots of other things, including some of the best teaching on the subject that's going on anywhere in the, in the world. Suggestion. Uh, and maybe this is to Jim or to those of us who are working in the di divestment effort. I'd like to call it the divest reinvest movement. For every dollar we take out of uh, carbon, carbon fuel companies, reinvest it in, in uh, new energy companies. So it, rather than just being a negative thing, divest, reinvest, a more, a more sensible and constructive and future-looking uh, uh, future uh, form of investment. So thank you. Dollar. Thank you, because we we now have three minutes. But there is a a divest invest uh, movement and going together. Could each of you respond to that? Okay. 
So I apologize for the caricature, but I only had seven minutes. Um, on the divest invest, um, it is indeed the case that everyone I know who's inv involved in divestment is doing a whole bunch more. That's not being communicated well. Um, I think many people are just hearing divest and not hearing it as part of a broader strategy. So anything that can be done to be clear that there's a broader strategy, uh, that would be extremely helpful. Now, I, I really apologize. This is a very active audience, and I can see all of you uh, really thinking about the questions you want to ask. I'm going to have to cut it off, but I'd like to have uh, both of our professors make a quick uh, closing statement, and, uh, and then we can thank them. So, Professor Engel. Oh, all right. Rebecca's going. Um, Thank you for being here. Climate change is the greatest challenge of our time. Finding a way forward is central. Um, we may disagree on tactics. Let's never forget that we don't disagree about the end goals and that our predominant goal must be to persuade those who've not even begun to think about these issues to take it seriously. Well, I want to thank uh, the audience, and I want to thank uh, Professor Henderson, too. I hope that this has been a, a conversation that has moved the case forward, no matter what side of the position or whether you're in the middle. Um, in a few days, Mary Robinson is coming to the Kennedy School. She's going to get an award. It's the Richard E. Neustadt Award. And uh, she was given an honorary degree by Harvard in 1998. She's president of Ireland. She was given an honorary degree for humanitarian work. She is now the UN Special Envoy on Climate Change. And last month she said, if you respect human rights, don't invest in what damages human rights. I just want to close by going back to something that Professor Henderson said. Get people whose lives are currently and in the future will be more impacted by climate change than anyone else and get them to tell their stories. Harvard has a good record on divesting regarding human rights and acting on it. This is a preeminent human rights matter. It isn't just Mary Robinson who says it, it's Archbishop Desmond Tutu, it's the UN, it's major church groups around the world. I think that we need to keep that in mind as well. It was said at the beginning, I think, of why is it that a professor of the humanities is representing this side? I guess the short answer is um, because it's about humanity. And uh, it's about a lot of technical, economic, and scientific things, but above all else, it's about the fate of the lives of a lot of people, including people who are unborn. Thank you. <laughs>